welcome to the College of Law at AdventureCon 2023. Uh, my name's Dr. Jeff Dan. I work for the Athenry Heritage Centre. And this morning, we're just going to have a little chat about medieval weapons and arms and fighting tactics, combat tactics, that sort of thing. Now, a talk like this uh, at a convention of role-playing games, the, the reason for that is pretty obvious. I mean, plenty of role-playing games over the years have been based in the medieval period or have drawn inspiration from the medieval period, or they've drawn inspiration from books and films that themselves have drawn inspiration from the medieval period. I mean, the obvious one is probably Dungeons and Dragons itself, uh, which draws inspiration from a lot of uh, literary works, but particularly from the works of J.R.R. Tolkien. Um, and I was introduced to Dungeons and Dragons back in 1977 by a good friend of mine. And I played Dungeons and Dragons and various other role-playing games pretty solidly for the next 10, 15 years, something like that. And like a lot of people when they're playing these games, when I was playing d and I created characters of virtually every class and every race. But probably my best loved and favorite character was a simple human fighter called Killmonger, a name that some of the yeah, more observant of you might notice I lifted directly from the pages of Black Panther. Um, but Killmonger was incredibly strong, stupidly brave, basically the go-to tank whenever our party needed a little bit of muscle on their adventures, which was pretty much every adventure, basically. But he was also extremely successful. And when he retired, he retired as a 46th level demigod who was armed with a weapon of legend, at least it was a legend amongst our group, a plus 10 Vorpal longsword named Ice, which is a name I should have copyrighted before George R.R. R. Martin got his hands on it. But there you go. Now, it's not surprising that Killmonger was armed with a longsword. If you look through mythology and fantasy fiction, you find numerous uh, heroic warriors armed with swords, especially long-bladed swords, long swords, hand and half swords, that sort of thing. I mean, Excalibur is probably the, the typical example, but there's also things like Grimir or Gram, the sword of Siegfried that he uses to kill the dragon Fafnir, or Khaled Bolg, the sword of Fergus MacRoic in the Ulster Cycle. Then you go into literature, there's things like Anduril, the sword of Aragorn in Lord of the Rings, which is pretty much based on, on Grimir. Uh, there's also things like the, the black sentient soul-sucking sword Stormbringer that's wielded by Elric of Melnibane. So when people are creating new characters, especially martial characters, or putting treasure into campaigns, it's pretty obvious why they would think that long swords, hand and half swords, that sort of thing, would be the weapon of choice. But in reality, if you go back to the medieval period, it's possible to argue that, to begin with, swords were not particularly common, but also that when you went into battle, they often were not the weapon that you actually would want in combat. Now, to understand why I say that, you have to go back to the medieval period and you have to look through the changing combat tactics and arms and weapons, because even though combat and weaponry and tactics didn't change in the medieval period quite as much as they have in the period that has followed this, the medieval period does cover a thousand years of history. And so tactics and armour and arms did change during that period. For example, you go back to the first half of the medieval period, particularly in Western Europe, and the principal um, combat tactic at that time was something called the shield wall. Now, the shield wall is a very ancient tactic, probably perfected by the Romans. And basically, it consists of you standing with your mates with a shield in a wall. I mean, the, the clue's pretty much in the name there. Now, when you're fighting in the shield wall, especially in the first rank of a shield wall, you're probably going to be facing either a horde running towards you, or more likely in the early medieval period, you're going to be facing another shield wall who are advancing on you or you advance on them. And you end up basically in a shoving match 
trying to push through the enemy's shield wall so that you can get around their flanks in behind them and start to kill them. Now, when you are in the front rank of a shield wall, this is not the weapon that you want because there are two reasons for that. The first reason is because the guys in the opposition shield wall are very likely to be the best armoured men in their army. And in the early medieval times, that means this sort of thing. This is what they call a nose guard helmet. Now, this is the sort of thing that was used by Vikings, the Anglo-Saxons, the Normans, that sort of stuff. And obviously, again, the clue's in the name, it is to protect your nose and your eyes and your face. And they were also likely to be wearing this, chain mail, or more properly, just mail. Now, chain mail, as you can see, very, very heavy, about 30, 40 kilos, something like that, if you've got it all over your body. But both of these are primarily designed to stop blades, especially the blades of swords. So really, if you're facing guys wearing this, a sword's not going to do you much good. But the other reason that you wouldn't want to be using a sword in a shield wall, the main reason, you've got to imagine how you would be fighting in a shield wall. So basically you're standing there, your friends are close by, beside you, the shield's interlinked, the rest of your army is pushing up behind you, trying to push you through the opposition shield wall, and that oppo opposition shield wall, your enemy, is inches from your face, like this. So really you have absolutely no room to do anything, certainly not to swing a long-bladed sword or even stab with a long-bladed sword. So what you need is something shorter that you can hack and slash the enemy with. Now, the Romans, who were the kings of the shield wall, they understood this very well. And so they armed all of their in in infantry with a short sword, the gladius, which is where we get the term gladiator from. Now, short swords were still available in the early medieval period, but the Anglo-Saxons and the Vikings also used other types of weapons when they were in a shield wall. Things like this. This is a one-handed axe. And when you're in a shield wall, this is great because you can hack over the shield of your enemy into their heads or their shoulders, all that sort of thing. So a pretty good weapon to have. Or, and this is a little mock-up I made because I haven't actually got one of these, but this is just to show you what this would have looked like. <coughs> this is a six, which is basically a cross between um, a meat cleaver and a carving knife. So you can imagine the sort of damage that you would be able to inflict with these short blows underneath the shield, up under the shield, into the head, that sort of thing. So pretty nasty stuff. Now, of course, the guys in the second and the third rank are going to be using different sorts of weapons. They're going to be using things like this, the spear. Very useful, versatile weapon, but in a shield wall, the guys in the second and the third rank can stab down over the heads of their own soldiers into the enemy behind their shields. Or, they might use this. This is a two-handed axe. Uh, again, this would be used to hack down into the enemy over the heads of your men in the first rank. Now, this is particularly popular amongst the Anglo-Saxons, especially what they call the house carls, uh, who are the personal bodyguard of the Anglo-Saxon kings in England. There's a very famous scene on the Bayou Tapestry of the house carls armed with these things, surrounding the body of Harold after he's been shot in the eye, as they say, and trying to fend off the Normans who are trying to mutilate his body. As a little aside, just to sort of illustrate one of the things that role-playing games sometimes get a little bit wrong, I used to play, uh, as well as doing there, I used to play a game called RuneQuest, which some of you might be familiar with. And I rem remember reading um, a little article that said that if you had a battle in RuneQuest between a thousand men on each side, all armed with two-handed axes like this, at the end of the battle, because of the fumble rules as they existed in the game at that time, at least 13 of those men would have chopped their own heads off. Uh, which you can imagine is a pretty difficult thing to do with something like this. So, so maybe role-playing games don't get mass combat right all of the time. So... Fighting in a shield wall was brutal, it was nasty, 
and it was the go-to tactic for most of the first half of the medieval period, particularly in Europe. But then a new tactic emerges that supersedes or takes the emphasis away from the infantry. And that new tactic, of course, is heavily armoured men on horseback. Now, the move to heavy cavalry uh, probably is introduced into Europe by the Normans, who use it when they're conquering England, they use it when they're invading Ireland, all that sort of thing. And originally they would just be wearing the same sort of stuff, the mail, the nose guard helmet, this sort of thing. But as the period progresses and armour making, armour manufacturing becomes a little bit better, you start to move into this stuff. You can see how tough that is, that's plate armour. Now that is very heavy, very expensive, but very, very tough, particularly against blades. So again, you know, if you're armed with a sword and you're facing someone with plate armour, you're going to be having difficulties. And what happens is when this becomes the tactic of choice in the second half of the medieval period, you start to see a proliferation of what we might call more industrial weapons, shall we say. Things like this, the war hammer or the horseman's pick. Now, this could be used by men on horseback, but it was also often used by infantry against armoured knights on their horses. And the idea was, and it's very brutal, I must admit, but the idea was that when the horseman approaches you, you bury the spike into their thigh or their calf, you pull them from their horse, and you turn it round and you beat them to death with the other end, basically. So, <laughs> as I say, it's pretty brutal stuff. Um, but possibly not as brutal as this. This is a flail. And that head on there is what they call a morning star. Now, flails are not particularly common. What's more common is when a head like that is mounted directly onto a wooden or a steel shaft to create a mace. Now, when I was playing Dungeons and Dragons, the cleric class was limited to using things like this, maces, hammers, that sort of thing. Um, that's probably based on the, the works of Sir Thomas Aquinas, who said that priests should not kill or shed blood. Um, it's rubbish, of course. In the medieval period, lots of priests turned up to battle with spears and axes and all sorts of things. And anyway, if you hit someone with that, they're going to shed a little blood, you would have thought. <laughs> so, you know, so in reality, these sorts of things are what they would be using to fight men on horseback, using mail like this, plate armour. Now, maces and Hammers and things like that were not new, but they did come to prominence more in the second half of the medieval period. And another weapon that came to prominence to fight the guys on horseback wearing plate armour is this. This is a longbow, an English or a Welsh longbow. Now, this is not a particularly strong longbow. This is a 44-pound bow. Um, they have found bows. They found bows actually when they brought the Mary Rose up in uh, the 80s that were estimated to be a 180 pound bow. So that's the equivalent of lifting 180 pounds with one arm every time you pull the bow. And the longbowmen would train for 10 years, something like that, have humps of muscle on their back because they had to fire these powerful bows. And the bows would have arrows like this. Now, they would have different heads on them, or bodkins, they'd have big pointy ones to go through the chain mail, they'd have one with barbs on that you would have to push through the body and break off at the other end to pull out, or they would have what they call bullet point, like this. And this is designed to go through plate armour. But in reality, it very rarely did. The plate armour was too tough, even for the bowmen, no matter how heavy the bows they were, by the end of the period, most of the time, it would simply bounce off this stuff. Now, of course, if you've got 5,000 English bowmen firing 15 arrows a minute with this, that's 7,500 arrows a minute going into the French cavalry or whoever's attacking, sometimes the arrows find a chink in the armour, they find a gap somewhere, and they cause damage. But really, most of the damage that would be done to people like this 
would be through the constant bludgeoning of the arrows on the armour. And so to counteract that, they wore this stuff. This is gambeson. So this is to, to withstand impacts and broken bones and bruises and stuff like that. Really, the damage that these things did was the confusion and the fear that they sowed into the advancing army, which allowed the English men-at-arms, their own knights, to attack. So, in medieval times, you know, in most of the combat situations, the sword would not be the weapon that you would initially go to. But, I hear you cry, or maybe I don't, but <laughs> I am talking about warfare. I'm talking about mass battles. As we, as we established earlier, that's not really something that role-playing games like D&D and other role-playing games deal with, particularly. It's more to do with one-on-one -on -one combat, small groups, that sort of thing. So surely, you're thinking, when you are fighting one-on-one, -on -one, uh, surely the sword is the weapon that people would go to. And you do have a little bit of a point. Um, if you look at the medieval period, throughout the medieval period, there are loads of manuals giving you techniques for fighting one-on-one -on -one or in small groups with swords. And they range from things like this. A one-handed or what they know as an arming sword, which would usually be paired with this, a steel shield or a buckler. And there's lots of manuals that deal with techniques for fighting with this, but it's actually where you get the term swashbuckler from, because most of the techniques basically uh, consist of swashing with the sword and hitting them with the buckler. So swashbuckle, right there. <laughs> there you go. So, but there are also manuals that deal with things like this. This is a long sword. Now, a long sword can be used either one-handed like this, or it can be used two-handed. But it's usually in the manuals it is used two-handed, either with two hands on the hilt, or with one hand on the hilt and one hand on the blade. And that allows you to do a number of thrusts and cuts and parries and all that sort of thing. And if you look through the manuals, they basically add up to a pretty sophisticated um, sword fighting martial art in Europe at that time. I mean, it's a very sophisticated way of fighting, as I say, lots of thrusts, parries, feints, all this sort of thing. And that really is something that fantasy fiction often sort of washes over. And certainly when you, you play in role-playing games, it's something that doesn't really exist to any extent. Although to be fair, if you were to go into that sort of minute detail when you're playing role-playing games, you'd get pretty bogged down. <laughs> if you had to roll the dice for every feint and every parry, you'd be there forever. Um, but one of the things that uh, the manuals does say is that most of these techniques are for fighting on armoured opponents, especially armours who are not wearing plate armour. Now, when you are fighting an opponent who is wearing plate armour, most of the manuals refer to what they call the Maud Hab, or the murder stroke. And basically what that means is you grab the sword by the blade and you beat them to death with the pommel. <laughs> <laughs> Because the sword just ain't going to cut it. <laughs> so, really, when you're in medieval period, if you're fighting in a shield wall, you don't want a sword. If you're fighting against armoured opponents, you don't want a sword. So you might be thinking to yourself, why are swords the archetypical medieval weapon? Well, really, there's, there's two reasons. There's one minor and one major reason. The minor reason is that, you know, I'm going, to, I'm going to sort of flip it on its head here, just ignore everything I've just said. Um, but no, the minor reason is that despite everything I've just said, swords are very important all-round weapons. They're very good backup weapons to your main weapon in combat. They've got a lot, lot bigger range than, say, an axe or a, a hammer or something like that. You can slash, you can stab, and they are very good against unarmoured opponents. Um, but the real reason why swords are probably the archetypical weapon of the medieval period, or seen as that anyway, is the fact that swords 
were very expensive to make and therefore rare. And so at least up until the early part of the medieval period, the sword was the weapon of the princes, of the kings, of the noble knights. In fact, in Europe during the medieval period, there are a number of laws that are passed that actually ban anyone but nobles from being able to carry a sword in peacetime. So they become this weapon that is the sword of the noble. And it's probably for that reason that swords are placed into the hands of you know, heroes in mythology, people like Roland or King Arthur, these sorts of people. And therefore, why they f uh, come into fantasy fiction and straight into role-playing games, why people, when they're rolling or creating fighting characters, they think, well, he's got to have a sword, hasn't he? But really, you know, if you want to, if you want to carry on with that, that's perfectly fine. I mean, obviously, these games are, are meant to sort of be fantasy to, to fulfil these sort of fantasies. And, you know, as I say, the sword was a weapon that was used quite a bit in medieval times. But perhaps if you are looking to add a little bit more medieval real, realism to your character or to your game, something like that, maybe next time you are creating a character or adding treasure or something like that to your game, you might look beyond the sword. Because, you know, sword, uh, medieval combat was not simply, and I'll quote the, quote the name of the, the lecture, they were not simply a storm of swords, as George R. R. Martin would have you believe. So maybe if you want to inject a little bit more realism into your campaign or your characters, leave the swords at home and have a look at some of the other options that the rich history of uh, combat in the medieval period actually offers to you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, I don't know if anybody wants to ask questions or anything like that. If you're welcome to, if anybody's got any questions. Sure, where'd you get your doctorate in? I'm in uh, Irish history, not medieval oh, history. No, 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 no. <laughs> modern Irish history, actually. Like, yeah. So but so I've worked at the Heritage Centre, which is a medieval centre, so I've been there for eight years, so I've, I've sort of got... I'm, I was always a medievalist, really, until I did my doctorate. And <laughs> for some reason, I did it in something else, but I've gone, sort of gone back into the medieval history now. And what were the Irish mercenaries? The Gallic Glass, were the Irish mercenaries? The, I, yeah, the Irish, they were actually Scottish mercenaries. Oh, it's Gallic Glass, but they were, came over and they fought for the Irish, um, Irish against the English. And, and the they would use big, big swords. I mean, they were famous for using big swords like that, yeah. But they were one of the... That's an exception. That's why they're famous for it. Something. If they had made oral swords, do you think they would have been more common on the battlefield? Uh, probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I should have thought so. <laughs> yeah, it would certainly be a help. You would have thought. Is there a medieval equivalent of the five-man adventuring party? Well, I mean, yeah, it probably is. I mean, you know, people would go out for. To, to find treasure or whatever, like, yeah, I mean, there, there would be smaller groups that would uh, roam the countryside, you would have thought. So, yeah, I would have thought that definitely in medieval times would be people like, Where does all brigands? Sorry? Where does all brigands? Yeah, yeah, basically. Oh, it's not very good. We just finished the front. What's the weapon you would have been thrown, particularly in a wall town like that, right? Would any of those long swords be found in this area? Would they have been used? Yeah, they would, have, they would have done. Athenry was particularly wealthy town anyway, so I mean that there would have been a lot of people who would have long swords. And of course, being a Norman town, the same later on in the period, the Normans particularly would have uh, long swords as their secondary weapon. So they would have lances on their horses, but the long swords would probably be their secondary weapon. So most of the soldiers would have had long swords, uh, particularly in that second part of the, the medieval period. So any of the battles around here, what sort of warfare would you be talking about that would well, you'd be talking about heavy cavalry against, probably, if they're fighting the Irish, against shield wars, uh, which is why the Irish, unfortunately, are always defeated. Because unless you can form a wall across a gap that's guarded on each side, the cavalry just flank you and go behind you. Like, yeah, and that's why, that's why the advent of heavy cavalry sort of deals the end of the, the shield war, basically. Like. But unfortunately, the Irish never really adopt heavy cavalry.
So <laughs> they don't use don't use syrups for some reason. There's a, there's a battle as late as 1601, the Battle of Kinsale, and the Irish cavalry are still not using steel syrup. When was the syrup invented again? Well, it's, it comes from the Middle East, actually. The Normans uh, sort of brought it from the Middle East, and that's why the Normans invented this heavy cavalry. Because obviously, if you're, if you're hitting someone with a, a lance or something like that, you need a steel stirrup to brace yourself against, to get the power. And so that's why they could use this tactic that nobody else in Europe was using at the time. But as I say, the Irish, even though the, the, the Normans come to Ireland in the early 69, by 1601, the Irish are still not using steel syrups in their cavalry. So, <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> Was there any challenges in supplying the land for iron and stuff? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, there would have been. That's another one of the other reasons that, uh, you know, the, the, the longsword would have been um, But, like, here expensive. in particular, I'm not aware of at least any iron deposits around this area. Would it well, I mean, once the Normans get it, I mean, the Normans have got a huge empire, so they're probably getting iron from, from England, even from Italy, places like that. I mean, places like Athen Rye are, are the centre of a really big trading um, web across most of Southern Europe, actually, and England as well, of course. Like so if, there is, if we can't get the iron here, they're either making the swords in England somewhere else and shipping them over, or they're bringing the iron over. Like that. And of course, as you go through the medieval period, the um, extraction of iron, the techniques that they use to extract iron become easier and easier, and so they can produce more iron and, and make more weapons, basically. And so the price of swords does go down, and so by the end of the medieval period, they're quite a common weapon, at least more common than they were at the beginning. Did the Irish ever oh, use bog iron, like the Norse? Yeah, they probably would, yeah, but I mean the Irish, um, because as I say, the techniques and uh, whatever to make weapons, it's easier for them to make axes or spearheads and things like that. Less so that's less. what the Irish would have been using mainly. I mean, they would have had swords, especially the kings and the chieftains would have had swords, but mainly they would have been using axes and spears and things like that. Whereas the, the Normans, because they've got this big empire and they can find cheap iron, they're going to be armed with, with long swords, but only as their secondary weapon. When you're on a horse, your first weapon is your lance or your spear. Uh, the longsword is basically for when the, spear, uh, the shield wall shatters and they're running away and you can ride after them and hack them with your sword. That's what the sword's for, basically. How do you think that the Irish did the stuff on the, the Irish weapons and the, the spears and some of the, the Irish mythology didn't just bleed into the Indian Army and those pieces? Because there's some great stories. Oh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, well, I mean, I think because. You know, when you're looking at D&D &D and stuff like that, originally, it's, it's, as I say, it's mainly influenced by J.R.R. Tolkien. And he's drawing his, um, his inspiration from Norse mythology and English folklore mainly. And of course, in Norse mythology, as I say, you've got sort of like Grimir and Graham. But even then, you see, I mean, it, this is another thing. He's talking about long swords. He's talking about Angoril and this sort of thing. There is a theory, actually, that Grimir, Graham, um, Seafried sword would have been a CX. That's what it would have been, because that's, that's the sort of sword that they would have actually been carrying, because this is what they would use to fight in the shield war. So it might not have been a long sword, but maybe Tolkien just took the name, presumed it was a long sword, because that's what Excalibur and all these other swords were, and, and did it like that. But I mean, it's possible that it could have been something a lot shorter, and not really a sword. In actual fact, more like a, a hatchet, basically. So thank you, everybody. Thanks for listening. You are very welcome.